righty. Okay, Gabe, uh, go ahead and take it away, and and uh, we'll uh, we'll move on from from you to uh, Matt, and then to myself. And hopefully, Kevin set up the per permissions to share your screens. Well, I guess we'll find out. Yeah, we'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> have to find the right. There we go. I think this is it. You see my screen? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. yeah, okay. So it does work. Good. Great. Okay. Let me just move my Zoom window around so I can see you guys. All right. Okay. Um, yeah, so this is, these are, this is a summary of the rigs that I have. Um, this is kind of a, a long list of different things that I've been working on through the years and what I have deployed now. Um, so let's, let's just start. So there, for, I, I generally run about two to three rigs a night whenever I image, um, and they all have this common kind of element to it. Um, one of the main common elements is a Pegasus Astro Ultimate Power Box V2. That's this thing right here. And this controls um, both the power and data distribution. Um, power distribution to the mount, to the cameras, to, um, to actually even the, the PC. Um, and then it's also uh, has, is, you know, has a USB hub attached uh, internal to it. And the nice thing about all this is that you can switch those on and off, um, each component on and off as you need. So you don't have to run outside to power cycle something in case it's having issues connecting. You can power cycle both the, the power and the data um, so that um, you can reconnect to it quickly. Uh, it also has uh, environmental sensors and uh, do control. So I think there are three do, uh, do outputs, do control outputs uh, that you can have adjustment in the software as well. On the left is a, 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 a PC um, that I am mounting on top of that. And all this is mounted on top of one of my uh, larger telescopes. But this is a common sort of package that I have for, um, for most of them, uh, where I have the Pegasus Astro power box and then, and then a PC connected to it. Um, and then all the PCs that I have are basically this, the Azul Inspire PC. I think now they're discontinued, or at least you can't buy them on Amazon anymore. But it's an i5 with eight gigs of memory and 500 gigs of disk space. Um, so that's, I mean, that's really the common element aside from like obvious things like mounts and things like that. But this is really common across all you know, the main three systems they have. Does that include um, the pitchfork, uh, Gabe? Pardon? Does that include the pitchfork? Is that uh, a common element? <laughs> oh, <elk>? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's in case I have any raccoons come in. Oh, in OK, here. good. <laughs> no, um, this is my uh, high resolution system. It's one that I got um, about a year ago. It's the AG Optical 12 and a half inch. Um, it's running natively at six, f6.7. Um, so uh, this is on top of the AP 1100 mount. And as a focuser, I have a Moonlight Nightcrawler. And this is uh, a nice, really nice focuser in that its um, step resolution is on the order of um, less than a micron, um, which is probably overkill for an, a system like an f6.7. Um, but it also has rotation as well built in. So it's a, it's a focus or rotator. So you mm -hmm. can frame any uh, target you want in the sky with this thing. Um, as a camera, there's the full frame 6200 um, from ZWO uh, on the end here. Uh, and right now it's not connected with any wires or every, anything. Later you'll see the, the sort of hay nest of, of wires that I have um, with my cable management. But, it all lives uh, up here. There are only a couple of wires that go down for main power input um, from my control, um, sorry, my power distribution system. And then um, a couple cords for the mount power and data transfer. I could just wirelessly connect to the mount through Wi-Fi because the mount does um, offer that option, but I would prefer a, a wired connection so that there's less Wi-Fi interference in case all the different devices I have around are, you know, causing interference. So this is the main high resolution system. And these are a couple uh, images I've taken with it. Um, these are images that I've taken this year. Uh, it's been deployed since I think March. Um, I think that's when I installed it. And it, it, I'm really happy with it. It gives great resolution. Um, when I do luminance, it's bend at two by two. 
um, I still get about 0.6 arc seconds per pixel, which is a uh, pretty good sampling for our skies. So even at two by two, I'm getting good, um, good resolution with this. So pretty happy with it. Um, that's my main high, res high resolution imaging system. I have a dual rig system, which is lower focal length. Um, but what this is, um, are two telescopes uh, mounted side by side and aligned. Um, telescope A down here is a Takashi FSQ-106 at F5. Um, and that has a focal length of 530 and that matches reasonably close within about 10% of the second telescope, which is a stowaway at uh, 489 focal length. Um, and then both of them have uh, a rotator. So there's the Pegasus Falcon rotator, which is an electronic rotator, and then a, another Moonlight Nightcrawler that does the focusing and rotation uh, on the 106. <clears throat> and then both are a 2600 chip. With this guy, it's the, the monochrome. So you have a filter wheel. And with this guy, it's a, um, it's a Bayer matrix. So it's a color, uh, color camera. And that way I can shoot luminance all day with this one and then let this one collect RGB color through the one shot color and have double the data collection in the same amount of time it would take me to, um, you know, to, to do a night and to go over a night. All this is on top of a Mach 2 um, and it has absolute encoders. It's, it's a really nice mount. It, it more than easily, more than capable of handling this amount of weight. I'm not sure exactly what the weight is, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's over 40 pounds with all the gear that I have on there. Hey, hey, what's the buggy it's on? Yeah, this is a this is a good question. This is a scope buggy. Um, and is it? So, yeah, this this one is just three wheels. Uh, I made modifications to make the um, to make these. Um, uh, I don't know what you call them. Um, the uh, the bar that drills into the ground. I, I made them so that it's, it's more flat. Pardon? Levelers. levelers. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, the levelers. I. I uh, bought some um, upgrades from McMaster Car. I found the right thread pitch and, and everything and and put these on here. And what I do is um, just put a piece of wood under them. I don't really use them to turn them or anything. I just lift them a little bit, put a piece of wood under them that relieves pressure off the tire so that as the night goes down, it's not, you know, the tire cools and it, it sags a little <laughs> bit and it might affect your guiding or something. Um, so I put those down and, um, and I'm able to, quickly deploy. So I roll this thing out, polar aligned with the polar scope, and then in less than five minutes, I have both scopes aligned and ready to go. So these, these sit in my garage and I can you know, deploy them in whenever there's clear night pretty quickly. Um, yeah, so that's, that's that one. Um, part of the system, I have this side-by-side -side system here. And on the left is just a normal like double Vixen, the narrow, uh, width saddle and then a Lowe's Mandy of the wide width saddle. So it's capable of accepting both. On the right, I added a, a TGAD um, system for uh, from ADM. Uh, and what that allows you to do is precisely align this scope with respect to this scope, because there's going to be a little bit of a misalignment. And with, with these focal lengths so close together and the chip size the same, you really have to dial in those two frames um, otherwise it's, you know, you might have some offset and have, uh, just an overlap, uh, an intersection of those frames that you could use for actually, uh, stacking. Um, and in this way you can use the, the entire frame for both of them, or at least the entire frame for the FSQ 106. Um, so, um, you're not removing any field of view, uh, if you have something like this, the downside of that is this thing is kind of heavy. So it adds quite a bit of weight, uh, to your setup. Uh, but I think that that's a good trade-off. Um, having having both of them aligned and getting double the imaging in the same amount of time is is a good trade-off. And then in the middle is again that package I said before. There's the Pegasus power box, and then the computer, and then my rat's nest right here. Uh, this is another view, uh, just showing uh, the usual scope sort of park position I have it in. Um, the challenge with uh, the Mach Two, at least for my use case is that um, I can't polar align when it's positioned like this. The polar scope inserts to from the left here, from the right when you're looking towards north. Mm -hmm. um, and you have to rotate this in RA uh, away from this mount or this park position. And um, you know, it's, it, it adds a little bit of time. It's, not, it's actually not that big of a deal, but occasionally you'll forget that the scope is 
you forget to take the scope out. And then as you're slewing around, it'll, it'll bump into it, which could cause problems. But, uh, but overall, I'm very happy with this system. Um, hey, can I ask you a question view. about polar alignment? What, with all the software that's out there that does such a good job of polar aligning a scope without a polar polar scope, why don't you yeah. do that? So um, part of it, it yeah, I, so there are two um, two ways that we could do this. One is polar scope. The other one is so, use software. And ordinarily, I'm a tech guy. I like tech. Um, using software would be my go-to, but the the thing with that is that I have to pull out my computer or I have to pull out my phone to, in order to like look at the tech and everything. I just, and I've got four kids that running around. So I just want to pull my stuff out, put a scope on it, look at it, dial it in and then go away and not have to worry about like the electronics or pulling up an app and having it, having Wi-Fi interference so that the transmission of this from this computer into my phone or something, it's, um, yeah, it's that delaying. makes sense. That makes sense. Oh, it's the, it's I, cool to be old school, man. That's all right. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I, yeah. I I agree. So the user experience with the Rapus is phenomenal. It, yeah. I didn't trust it at first, but it's just as good if you ask me. And it is so quick. I, I couldn't. Yeah. I didn't think you could get quicker than Bullmaster. It is. It is. Yeah. It is. Arguably, it might not be as accurate, but at some level, once you get close enough, unless you're taking like one hour subs, it's probably not going to matter. Right. So. Um, this is just an, uh, another view showing more clearly the setup. So, um, uh, yeah, I mean, there, there's not much extra here other than the rat's nest and, and so on. Uh, these are a couple images that I've taken with it um, that I've showed recently. Um, this one's the the seahorse nebula, <clears throat> uh, a dark nebula. This one's, I think, like the anglerfish nebula or something like that. I think that's what it's called. This is a dark nebula as well. Um, and this these two benefited really, really well from just one scope taking luminance all night, the other one taking uh, one shot color images all night, and then I combine them in the end. And the, these are the results. Um, the fact that their focal lengths are slightly different means that in Pix and Sight, I do have to uh, be a bit more um, aggressive with the uh, distortion correction when stacking or when aligning when aligning frames. Uh, but that's uh, those settings, once you got those dialed in, um, you know, everything lines up pretty well. So, are, you using then, light, are you using a light pollution filter at all? Uh, let's see. Yes, uh, with this one, um, with this scope in here, I have uh, the Optolong L Pro uh, filter, which uh, does improve contrast in light polluted skies. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then this one is, uh, is a color RGB for stars, and then the TAC 106 has um, SHO, so all the narrow bands, sulfur 2, HA, and O3. Uh, this is the tulip nebula. All right, um, and then these. This is my typical night uh, when I when I run my gear. I have the the big high res scope, and then the the low uh, the wider field dual scopes there. Uh, I also have a more mobile system that I that I bring out occasionally. Um, probably, I mean, this one's dead simple. I, I said it takes five minutes to roll this stuff out, align it, and, and then uh, let Voyager say start the night, and it takes over. Um, the mobile system takes a bit more to set up, mainly because I actually have to lug the stuff out and then align it with uh, with Polemaster. I don't have a wrap ass for that. Uh, but this one is uh, this is an example of a Red Cat uh, fifty one. Um, on top of an, a rainbow astro mount. These are the those harmonic gear mounts. They're really small and compact. Uh, it can carry a lot of weight. Um, and so I have, and this is the pole master, which I use for aligning. So that's what I was saying before, where I have to get my phone out or computer out to, to, to help with that alignment. Um, and then this is that usual thing that I do, the um, ultimate power box in blue there, and then my PC. Uh, and on the other side of this is uh, a Falcon rotator and uh, ASI 2600 MC. So this is a color, um, just a color all night basically for, for this setup, which is fine for especially dark skies. Like if, if it's a new moon, I'll pull this one out. Uh, if it's a full moon, I wouldn't dare use this because it's it, it would just be a waste of time, I think. All right. Um, I have some 
other things that I use for my, my whenever I set up, uh, I have um, like a, an Astro sensors uh, set up here where I have a, an all sky camera, which right here in this image, it's right here, but I've since mounted it onto this mast. Uh, and that gives me an image of, of what the sky looks like. And then I have some sensors for how dark the sky is and, and the sky temperature, which helps assess whether there are clouds. But since I've used this, this is really the, my go-to for just assessing what the sky is like, because you can directly look at um, at the at the image and, and understand, you know, what the what the sky is like, how bad the clouds are, if the clouds are coming in, if it's perfectly clear, or whatever. Um, whenever I so I, I have these three systems, and each has the same type of box, um, and uh, how do I? you might be wondering how do I control like the data how do I get the data all together and I when I first set up a, a long time ago I would just either directly connect a, a laptop to the system or have like a USB stick that, that I would save to and pull the USB stick over and transfer that stuff but ever since um, I started with these multiple rig setups uh, this is kind of the setup I had so each PC for my rigs is is here um, and these are all running like Voyager um, which is a control system uh, software for, for acquisition. Um, and they all uh, are synced to, to Dropbox. So whenever I have a sequence that would um, run, it would save the, the FITS file directly to Dropbox. And that's synced to my main computer that actually I'm using now for this presentation. And then uh, a NAS, a network attached storage, uh, is also getting that from, from uh, from, sorry, from Dropbox. And so what would happen is that within a few seconds, I would have all this stuff in Dropbox and then it would be distributed to all my other computers. Um, from there, I run my, my planner, which I gave a, a presentation on last month about how that works. Um, from that, I can do my pre-processing, which I, dem uh, I, you know, I demonstrated there and then Pix and use Pix Insight to get the final image. Um, but that's sort of the typical flow. So acquisition here goes through Dropbox and then comes through to the final image here. Um, the planner itself can inform the um, all the Voyager instances, like how good or bad the data is to, to help adapt to like how much more data you need to get if you have a really bad night, it'll assess that. Um, and then also um, within Dropbox, uh, within the Synology NAS, I have a regular backup. So. If you delete a file in Dropbox for like on this PC or on this computer or this PC, it'll be removed from Dropbox. But with, with this backup, this nightly backup, um, it's always stored to my network attached storage. And in addition to all that, I have uh, nightly whole computer backups to, to the NAS as well, which is really helpful in, in case this machine like fries or maybe gets rained on or gets stolen or something, I can still recover every uh, piece of information from that machine with these entire PC backups. So this is kind of how I organize all these systems and, and get all the data uh, together in one place and kind of keep my sanity with, with all this. And this is what a, it's a typical night would look like. Uh, I have two instances of Voyager running on the different machines. Right now, I'm in this case, I'm just running two different, um, the two rigs, the, the high resolution rig and then the dual imaging rig. Uh, and that's what the two instances of Voyager here are. And then this is the, the planner that I shared last month. Um, yeah. Within Voyager, within the drag script that I use, uh, I have I have it push any notif any new changes uh, as a notification through Telegram to my phone. So I can get status updates of like how the night's going and, and whether a sequence has failed, whether focus has failed and things like that, which is nice. To, so I can you know spend time with family while things are data is gathering and I have to look at the computer all the time. Um, I added this photo. There's the high energy or high, high precision rig with um, uh, with all the cables and everything, which I've tried to clean up, but it seems like I always have issues with, with cable management. Uh, but there's this uh, LED panel that I use for flats for this, because this is a 12 and a half inch um, diameter scope. And this this diameter here is even larger. Um, so this thing is like 24 by 24, um, and I programmed it so that it, I can get a pretty good flats from it. So that's what I use for all of my, all of my, uh, scopes, uh, that I put in the garage here. 
And then I have, um, so these are all um, things that I've deployed or, or used like within the last um, six months or so. There are other systems that I'm working on. Um, one is this Takahashi 160, which is a hyperbolic, uh, I think it's hyperbolic Newtonian. And um, what this is, is it's a F3.3. So it has a similar focal length, but it gathered uh, to the FSQ 106, but it gathers um, quite a bit faster, about a full stop faster. Um, so I have this and my plan is to use it with a QHY 268 and probably put this either on the a Mach 1 that I have or RST-135 if, if it'll support it, um, which I have to test. This is a test image that I got from it about a year and a half, two years ago of the horse head. I think this was only about an hour and a half to two hours uh, of data. And it got me a lot of really good contrast. Uh, and I think that's what I can get with that uh, F3.3 system. Another one I'm toying with is uh, an AG optical 10-inch uh, F5 scope that they have as a They've discontinued it since, but um, it has uh, pretty good um, spot sizes across like a ASPC size chip, uh, which is what I'm planning to use with it. And I'll probably put this on my Mach 1, uh, maybe the Mach 2, I don't know. And then some other long, or sorry, um, uh, short focal length, high wide field of view um, systems. One is, a, you, there are two camera lens systems. One is the Sigma Art, which has this crazy F1.4. Um, uh, focal ratio, and I'm pairing this with a 2600 uh, monochrome camera. And then this thing here is actually a really neat device. It's an Astro Mechanics Canon focuser. Uh, so this uh, this lens is like a Canon mount, so you can mount that to this uh, focus mm -hmm. system, and it electronically sends the signals to the lens to do the right focusing. And so you could do V curves with this um, without having to, to actually put on a Canon camera or, or anything like that. You can mounted directly to an astronomical camera like a 2600 here. There's another system, a Rokinon, which I've been toying with in the past. Um, this is one of the images I got from it. And then some old rigs. This is an old Newtonian that I used, a uh, 10 inch F4, um, got this from Germany. Um, this, this is a very, this is a probably one of the longest running uh, rigs I had. It's given me um, hundreds of hours of data a lot of really good uh, images from it. These are a couple of them. Um, and then I have one <laughs> very, it was a very fun scope. Uh, it's 200 millimeter focal length, uh, 55 millimeter aperture at F3.6. And uh, it's really tiny, but it was gave, gave some great field of views. Um, and then some older stuff that, I, that I've toyed with uh, in the past. My first scope imaging, uh, deep sky imaging was this 106 um, aperture triplet. Um, and then I decided to play my hand at the high resolution game and, and had this AT uh, AstroTech eight inch uh, Richie Creighton. And that was difficult because it was a lot longer focal length and probably more weight than my Atlas EQG mount could handle. Um, but it was fun uh, learning that system. And then I've had like Smith Cassegrain's different uh, refractors, um, and then another Richie over here that's an eight, uh, ten inch in this case. But I got that one for a deal off of Astromart, so I, I had to try it. And then I tried it for about a year, and then and sold it. But yeah. So that's um. Let's see. That yeah. I think that's it. Uh, that's my my presentation on the different systems that I've brought, uh, ran in the past. I'm happy to field any questions. Perhaps I think maybe the scope the scope of this was imaging rigs, right? So you do you still have your solar scope? Uh, yeah, I have the solar. I have a Lunt eighty double stacks uh, solar scope, and I also have a um, the same thing that you have, Jeff, the Quark Chromosphere, yeah, uh, which can go on any refractor. It can't go on like a Schmidt cast or anything like that. It has to be, yeah, the lenses have to be in the front of the of the chain, but. Um, it can go on any refractor. So in principle, yeah, you, you could use that on a 160 millimeter telescope, for example. Yeah. I think the the other thing we all, all overlook, right? I think you make the majority of your cables, at least power cables, right? Yeah, yeah, I make my power cables through uh, rig runner um, connectors, yeah.
Well, this is going to be a hard act to follow. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, uh, Matt, are you still are you still willing to give your presentation? <laughs> I am. That, that is going to be. I feel really ridiculous now uh, <laughs> trying to follow that up because. So I um, I just moved here about a year and a half ago from Seattle, and uh, I joined uh, the club uh, pretty much immediately. I've been a um, a uh, visual astronomer for the last 10 years or so in Seattle, but we had a, um, uh, I was running a business and all that kind of stuff, so I didn't really do any of this. And then um, I used the club as a resource um, to uh, kind of start piecing together this uh, that you see behind me. Um, and so when I first started, it was, I, I basically bought a, the uh, Rokinon uh, 135, and uh, uh, used uh, a Canon 450D um, and was just shooting, um, uh, you know, pretty, I was shooting images with, with five to 10 second uh, exposures and um, really not getting very much, um, obviously. Um, and then, so I started, uh, I kind of plumbed the, the, the club and had a couple people, um, and talk to them about different mounts I could I could get. So I got the the uh, Skywatcher Star Adventure, and have been basically just slowly building uh, my knowledge. Because obviously I didn't I didn't really know what I was doing, um, and so I kind of went about this in a very methodical, slow way. And um, yeah, started <laughs> with those things, added the Star Adventure, um, and then added. Uh, the guide scope, um, and then just recently added the ASI 533 uh, a one shot color camera. Um, and I have an Optolong Alan Hansen there. And um, basically, I've been, um, oh, and yeah, just, I, again, like a piece, a piece by piece thing. And so I have uh, now the EAF that I'm going to uh, try to rig onto this. Um, but yeah, it's been it's been a, an incredible experience. Uh, just again, like piece by piece, um, building this. It, it, I've been going about it in a very different way than obviously than than Gabe or um, or any of the, the other people I see in cloudy nights and stuff. I I, I really enjoy the the kind of hands on element. So I don't have an ASI Air Pro or anything like that. I run everything via a USB uh, to the computer I'm using right now um, and run Nina on there and I'm able to set up my entire night, um, my sequence on, on there. Um, and yeah, I obviously have to find everything manually. So I spend uh, a day or two uh, previous really studying star charts because I realized pretty quickly that finding targets, um, I'm really glad I didn't my initial idea was to buy, like, I think what a lot of people at my uh, expertise level, which is low, um, want to go and buy, especially coming from the, the visual astronomy game, I wanted to go buy in this giant long focal length uh, uh, reflector or something like that. And I am very glad that I had a community of people who talked me out of that because even finding something with, with this Rokinon can be pretty challenging, especially if I'm looking for something relatively faint. And, um, and so, yeah, it's been, um, it's been an incredible experience, a very humbling experience. And um, yeah, I wish I had more to say. I, I, I obviously, this is um, coming off of the, the slideshow pre presentation before me. Um, I don't, um, <laughs> I, Matt, I feel a little absurd, but- uh, Matt, how do, that, that's a broken on camera lens? That you yeah, have. this is the Rokinon 135, so it's F, F2, I think. So how does the EAF work for, with that? The EAF uh, works a lot like, actually, this, so this, is, a, um, this is a Red Cat 51 uh, uh, ring. Um, and so basically, you, you end up doing it a lot like the Rokinon with the heli helical fo fo uh, focuser. Uh, you run a, a belt on the EAF. Uh, okay, got um, it. Around it, yeah. Yep. Um, I'm, uh, I'm talking with the Milwaukee Makers Club and they have a 3D printer and they're gonna print me a couple 
um, parts. I think that there's someone named Deep Sky Dad or something like that who mm. makes them for you, but it's much more expensive than just going off Spark Fun and getting a, a little gear set and right. getting a 3D printer. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I don't know if is, I'm in the same boat. I think a lot of us are, is we, part of this hobby is the tinkering, the tech side, the gear, the, the mm -hmm. mechanical side, the, right. That's why like for me personally, and I think a lot of other people share this, right. Even if I had buckets of money, you know, money was no object. I still don't think I would, you know, get time on a Cayman Island scope and hit a button and then I wake up in the morning and I have images in my email. It's just no fun. I agree. <laughs> the act of collecting the data is part of the the fun for me. Yeah, the the very first image I I ever I ever got was uh, um, was the Andromeda Galaxy, which I think is uh, a pretty common first first target. But the um, it it was the same feeling when I first started seeing, it, and it, it was on the 450D. So I I uh, you know took the took the picture, um, you know waited. I took all the pictures, put them into Deep Sky, Sky Stacker, did all that kind of stuff, and. And and when the first time I saw it, it was it was a lot like the first time you see Saturn through as a kid through a, a telescope. Mm -hmm. It's just it, it. There's something about collecting that data yourself, or like yeah, it, that's just it's so cool. And and <laughs> I'm sure they'll, they'll there will come a point um, where where you know I, I'll want to do the mini PC route or the ASIR route or something like that, just because. I, I have two kids, one of them is six months old. And so, so getting out there and doing all this is challenging, but I mean, that's, that's the, the beauty of it is like, you're, I, I do these things all day that, um, and, and then at night I'm able to, I mean, the, the data coming, the, the data I'm getting from the Andromeda galaxy is older than Homo erectus. Like <laughs> it, it's mind blowing. And so, yeah. Do Definitely. you have a finder you use to find things, or do you have to point, take a picture, look at it? Yeah. Uh, how use, do you do that with that setup? I use uh, the loop function. And so, so again, I, I spend like a day or two kind of figuring out exactly what I want to shoot and looking at the, the data around it in Stellarium. Um, or uh, yeah, I have a, a, um, a paper one, a book as well. But, and then, uh, yeah, I basically just star hop to, to find. So you use your guide scope and loop function, the PHD two or something? Uh, no, I, I use the 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 main the main imaging camera through Nina, and then there's a loop function in Nina as well. Yeah. Um, and so it'll just take pictures, um, and then I'm able to kind of star hop um, using. Uh, there's a kind of a slow motion knob here, and then uh, on the back side here, it'll speed up or slow down the 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 clutch here. So um, okay. I'm able to kind of move around. Just start mm -hmm. hop, yeah. Cool. I have noticed that, like, if I don't spend a day or two looking at it, it takes the entire night to find the object, <laughs> um, especially if it's a small one. Yeah. 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 But even that's like some people would consider that a wasted night, but I still feel like it's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, we all we all started there, and you'll probably get to a point where. You'll you'll get a taste of plate solve and then never want to go back. <laughs> uh, yeah, I uh, I can imagine it's 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 kind of like um, I actually still have a flip phone, um, and yeah, I like, took a dip into the smartphone realm and I was like, I, this is too easy. I need to pull back and uh, <laughs> yeah. I feel like it would be the same thing with 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 all that um, the go to stuff. That's great, Matt. I, I I love your I love your enthusiasm. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it 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 actually wears out after about forty years. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, there, there's so many images, you know, with like web behind you or something like that. You 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 almost get oversaturated with these just mind bending images. That right. um, yeah, it's uh, there's something about it. Like every once in a while, you have to do something. That uh, kind of re-sparks that uh, excitement <laughs> about yeah Andromeda. Yeah. Well, thanks, thanks very much. Good. Thank you. Um, 
Well, we're going to switch to the extreme other end of the spectrum. Um, uh, I have worked most of my life trying to be hands off <laughs> and, and, and basically uh, wake up in the morning and, and just uh, have the data uh, waiting for me. So, uh, so let me, uh, you know, I, I, I put a little extra slides in here uh, because I am going to be talking about a permanent uh, observatory uh, situation. Uh, so let me share a screen here. And all right, so let's go up here and start the slideshow from the from the beginning. Okay. Uh, all right, so uh, boy, about it's been ten years now. Uh, uh, I literally built a. When I got out of uh, when I got out of healthcare, I promised myself that I would I would uh, take uh, the uh, astronomy hobby that I that ha I've had all my life uh, far more seriously, and and uh, decided to build build my own uh, own observatory. Um, this has gone through quite a quite a round of 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 of. Uh, evolution. Um, uh, I went with a, a sky sky pod, a, uh, a, a dome half shell uh, observatory situation. Um, got frustrated with that uh, because of, of zenith issues, and and even if you offset the telescope within the within the dome, uh, you still have parts of the sky that that you can't get to. Uh, I then talked to Wayne, uh, the developer of the SkyPod, and asked for some advice about how I could actually roll the dome off. And uh, he said I was crazy. Um, uh, out of the over 2,000 SkyPods that he has sold, nobody has ever tried rolling off the dome. <laughs> and And so I am at least in his pool of users, the first one to to attempt this. Uh, but I'll get to that in a, in, in a moment. Um, so I have had the same system with minor modifications uh, for the last 10 years. Uh, and, and so uh, I have a Takahashi, uh, well here, the next, uh, next slide uh, you know, breaks it up. Uh, I have a Takahashi uh, 130. Uh, that's running at about f uh, 5.4. And um, uh, the only modifications I've made to the scope, uh, it came, it actually came with a four inch focuser. And I did replace that with a, uh, with a three inch uh, uh, feather touch. Um, but I've been using the same uh, S big filter wheel and S big uh, camera, uh, CCD camera for literally the last 10 years. And so, so uh, my setup has been, has been pretty, pretty stationary. And, and with the, with the goal of, of basically trying to get the entire system so automated that I don't have to be there in order to collect the data. That's why I'm say that I'm pretty much on the other, other end of the extreme. Uh, you can do that, of course, with a permanent observatory, uh, because you know you don't have to go through the polar alignments and 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 that type of thing. Um, and so, so I designed the observatory such such that that the uh, the the scope can can actually uh, be tested and 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 moved in every direction uh, without having to even open up the dome. And and so so one advantage I had early on is I could do all my testing and evaluation and 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 cabling and and all the software uh, within within the closed within the closed observatory. Um, so uh, you know, being a permanent uh, observatory, uh, you know, I really didn't want to. You know, I want to make. I wanted that this was probably an overkill. Uh, but I wanted to make sure that the pier was 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 rock solid, and 
And so after doing a lot of research on, on various designs, um, you know, I learned about things like frost line and, and, and how you have to get below the frost line and, and, and literally, can you guys see my, my cursor as well? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And so, you know, so I learned that I needed to get below the frost line and, and put in one of these big foots so that, because it doesn't really matter even if you go past the frost line, if you don't have an anchor uh, down deep, um, uh, the, the whole pier will get pushed up, uh, re, you, know, re, you know, regardless. And, and so, so I, I spent quite a bit of time uh, researching and designing, uh, you know, the pier structure. I also, I also learned that, that it, you know, you want to be able to walk around in the observatory while you're imaging. Uh, or if you have to make some, you know, some visit to the observatory, uh, so the pier is completely isolated uh, from the from the slab that the that the observatory uh, you know, sits on. Um, uh, again, when the concrete guys came out and and putting in uh, putting in the uh, the the J bolts, um, I actually had a. Um, uh, a uh, sundial or or the uh, 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 the ecliptic not the ecliptic but the uh, the meridian uh, 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 sundial on here and and I had all these concrete guys standing around waiting for the exact moment in time when the sun passed the 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 meridian and that's when I was able to put the put the J bolts in and align them to the perfect uh, celestial celestial north. Um, they did think I was kind of crazy at the time. Um, and so, so this is the, this, this was the final assembly, uh, with the isolated pier. Uh, and then, uh, this was a custom designed, uh, pier, uh, that allowed me to, to place the mount, uh, precisely where I could slew the telescope, uh, anywhere, anywhere within, uh, within the dome. Um, um. Basically, I've been using this this same system for the last ten years, uh, and and that is uh, I use these um, USB uh, Rangers. Uh, they basically convert USB to Ethernet, and then and then in my in my office, uh, I've run about two hundred feet worth of Ethernet cable. Um, you, you saw in that in in this trench here, I have a a, a three inch PVC pipe uh, buried. Uh, you can see where it's coming up into into the house. So from my office uh, through this pipe through out to the observatory is about is about 200, 200 feet. And and so basically everything uh, in the observatory is uh, USB based and and is is working through this uh, uh, this USB Ranger. Now I've subsequently have added other control devices for the dome automation and the power control of of all of the all of the devices, uh, but I'll get I'll get to that in in a second. But the camera control and the mount control and uh, virtually everything associated uh, with the image acquisition piece uh, is basically fed to me in real time uh, to my main computer here. Here in the here in the office, this has been an extremely reliable system for the. So I you know I don't have to worry about Wi-Fi or or uh, this is a, this is essentially hardwired, um, and and so I, I I don't have to and I keep I keep this device in a temperature controlled uh, uh, unit uh, so that it it doesn't experience you know the you know the harshness of our of our Wisconsin winters. Um, this is this is actually the the control box uh, where all of all of the control hardware is at uh, for the dome automation, uh, as well as uh, that uh, the USB driver. Uh, if you look inside there, it, it looks uh, like quite the quite the mess. Uh, but all the power supplies, um, uh, I have a Ethernet hub here uh, that is is running. These uh, these units, uh, these units are uh, essentially uh, software controlled hardware pieces 
that are under the control of something called Viking, uh, which is a, a program that runs underneath the uh, Voyager. And so this is a literally a relay box that's under software control. Uh, and I can write um, scripts uh, around how these switches are controlled. Um, every piece of instrument, including the lights and the fans and in the mount and everything uh, again is in this smart uh, power box uh, again that is controlled uh, by uh, uh, by uh, what's called drag script uh, which is a, a scripting program under under voyager um, uh, this is this box is temperature controlled there's a there's a uh, thermostat uh, or and a sensor here that detects what the temperature is in the box and in the summertime, it turns on the fan, and in the wintertime, it turns on a, on a ceramic heater. Um, okay, so the other, the other piece in, in having a fully automated observatory goal in mind is to have a, is to have a good weather station. Um, uh, I went uh, with, a, with a company called Sky Alert, and um, this... Uh, and a lot of my decisions uh, is is I am not a hands-on person. In fact, if I never have to touch hardware, that's a good thing. Um, and so I buy things that are plug and play. And and so if something doesn't interface with something else uh, without without a, with just a minimal amount of of, of tinkering, uh, you know I won't I won't go with it. And and so Sky Alert uh, basically. Uh, talks wonderfully uh, with, uh, with Voyager. And, and, and so uh, it is a full weather station and it gives me uh, you know, sky conditions, sky temperature, clouds, uh, you know, uh, basically all of, the, all of the parameters necessary to, you know, to monitor the, you know, the weather. And, and whether or not to, because if I'm not home, or I'm sleeping, uh, and you know, heavy clouds come in, or moisture, or that kind of stuff. You know, I want the observatory to automatically close, uh, which which it does. Uh, I've tested that where uh, you know we've had some prolonged. If, if we get prolonged clouds for a certain amount of time, it will automatically do what's called an emergency exit, and it'll park the telescope and close the observatory. Uh, uh, long before the sequence is 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 completed, um, so Sky Alert talks to 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 Voyager, and and you know, and I can set up uh, everything from you know for the clouds, wind, rain, uh, you know, light uh, light levels outside the observatory. Uh, a lot of the stuff is is don't cares. Um, and and but I can set things to suspend operations of the the observatory, uh, or in in the worst case, uh, you you do a hard exit, and 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 basically. So if, for example, uh, my weather station goes out and I don't, I'm no longer getting weather updates. Uh, you know that that'll trigger that'll trigger um, Voyager to you know to exit. Uh, uh, and do an emergency exit and and automatically uh, close close the observatory, um, and so the whole dome does in fact roll back uh, with uh, with uh, uh, this linear activator, uh, and it basically this is the largest linear <laughs> activator on the market. Uh, and oh, I'm sorry, uh, Gabe, you have a question? Yeah, I had a question on the previous yeah. slide about the the rain setting. Um, under rain wet, uh, does dew trigger that condition? Yeah, it does. Okay. Well, okay, because now there's a, it's interesting, there is a built-in dew heater uh, on the Keep moisture track. sensor. Right. Okay. Yeah, and uh, which, uh, which was a, a really nice feature because, boy, it does take time to close up the observatory. You know, I, you know, want to park the scope and, and then close the dome. I actually don't have to park the scope uh, to to initiate the closure, um, but it still takes you know about a minute or so for that dome to close. And then you know it all in told, it'll take about two minutes 
to to bundle up the uh, the observatory, and and so so I right now I'm I'm on the very conservative side. So if it if it if it gets if it gets very cloudy, um, you know I'll suspend the operations uh, during partial clouds and hope that they'll clear up. But but if I get full co cloud coverage, eh, I don't take a chance and. And the observatory you know, closes up, uh, you know, for me. Okay. Um, yeah. So this is like the the world's largest linear activator. Uh, this 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 basically has a, a uh, I think it's about forty five inches of 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 movement, um, and it's rated for rain and complete, you know, outdoor outdoor. Uh, um, uh, weather uh, conditions, um, and then uh, and so the dome does in fact roll back on 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 three three rails. Um, I recently just installed just two days ago um, uh, heat strips inside the inside the, the 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 rails because last winter I would get snow on these rails even though they're V shaped. Uh, I would still get some freezing and some and some ice buildup on on these on these rails. Um, so this this winter, so I don't have to go out there to chip off the ice. Uh, I've installed heaters uh, inside of all of these all of these rails. On the inside, uh, I actually have a winch motor uh, that that opens up the uh, opens up the clamshell. It's this device right here. And then I have another linear activator that, you know, because winches can't push, right? And so for those of you who come out to the observatory um, and see this in action, it, it, it's actually pretty, pretty unique because uh, what I do is I run off when I want to close this dome. Uh, it's easy to open it, um, uh, but to close it was, was the major issue. And so what I do is I just run slack on the on the on the um, on the winch motor, and then when the when the dome actually comes back to its home position, it's underneath this other linear activator, and this other linear activator actually closes, pushes the dome up past its gravity point, and then stops, and and then the winch slowly lowers the the clamshell the clamshell down. Um, Question? Everything was laying. Everything was laying in the same time. Michelle and I were we were having lunch at Maxwell, and all of a sudden. Uh, okay. Uh, all right. I hear I hear somebody talking in the background, but um, so anyway, um, so I use Voyager uh, just like Gabe uh, and uh, and its uh, sister software, uh, uh, Viking. Um, and literally, it controls everything in the observatory: um, uh, the mount, the cameras, uh, the you know the guide camera focusers, uh, the SkyX program. Uh, uh, the other beauty is, uh, like I showed in the previous Sky uh, slide, the Sky Alert uh, weather station does in fact talk to Voyager directly. It sends every five seconds. It sends a weather file over to Voyager, and Voyager reads all of the weather conditions uh, based on that on that uh, graphic that I showed, uh, and then uh, uh, either suspends operations or or resumes operations or exits uh, the 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 evening, um, and then Viking, as you saw through all of those control boxes. Uh, basically, does all of the all of the dome the dome control. Um, the other beauty of of drag of, of Voyager is is uh, the ability to write scripts. Uh, it's called drag script, and and this is my current sequence. I just looked at the different blocks within the, within my drag script and made this little chart. So at dusk, it it actually connects all the equipment and opens up the dome. Uh, unparks the telescopes, cools the camera, um, runs the uh, uh, waits for astronomical nightfall, slews to the target, does all the focusing. Um, so Matt, I, I actually completely hands off. I and in fact, I'm now at the stage where where if I do things manually, I screw things up. And so 
Um, so I, I pretty much uh, let this run uh, uh, all by itself. In fact, I set up the object that I that I want to do uh, in the afternoon and turn on turn on Voyager and basically the next time i touch the system is is the next is the next morning um and so it'll run the sequence then it'll stop auto guiding park the telescope close the dome warm up the cameras and disconnect the equipment right and and so in the morning uh, what i wake up to is 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 gabe's wonderful uh, uh planner here uh, which gives me a summary of everything that went on uh, last night. This, this of course, is uh, not all one night's uh, activity here, uh, uh, but uh, I can then switch to you know see you know what I have left to do on on this particular project. But typically in the morning, I wake up and and I'll it'll be one or two of these bars, and with all of the scatter plots and what's been accepted and what's been what's been what's been uh you know re rejected um and so so matt i'm on the other end of the spectrum uh you know i'm only interested in the data and 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 literally if i don't ever have to touch hardware for the rest of my natural life that is great for me uh because i get my excitement in the process in the processing right and 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 I leave it to all of the young folks to do all the hands-on stuff. <laughs> so the next I, time I try to carry all this stuff out before my baby starts crying, right? Yeah, I, <laughs> yeah. I will yeah. Uh, be very jealous of your workflow. Yeah, uh, yeah. Actually, the 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 key the key point is is I don't have I've worked very hard not to have any workflow. Um, my workflow kind of ends. Uh, there's a feature within Voyager that allows you to, to you know, uh, uh, define a whole bunch of objects uh, that you'd like to image. And they, they go into a database and I just pick out the object that I want to, you know, start a project on and, and then uh, Voyager, Voyager does the rest. I think this was, yeah, I, I threw this slide in here at the, at the very end in case there are questions about setup and that kind of stuff. But, um, but but literally, um, um, you know that's that's my whole routine. I've I have worked the last ten years to be as as to be completely hands 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 off. Uh, and I guess I've gotten past. I've never ever been a visual person, and and so so I I'm coming from a whole different you know. Um, uh, every time I've ever tried to do visual work, all I see is my eyelashes and the eyepiece and 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 fuzzy gray objects. And so, so I've never I've never and I've I pride myself in in actually have never I have never owned an eyepiece in 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 all of the in the last uh, twelve years that I've been that I've been doing uh, uh, astronomy work. So, anyway, any any questions? Ah, cool. So let me unshare here. And let's see. How do I do that? Oh, here we go. All right, cool. All right, well, we're we're on the hour, but, uh, you know, typically uh, uh, we can just kind of open it up to just general discussions or, or uh, any of the I, I, I don't recognize all of the names. Uh, Brian, are, are you a new member? Uh, yeah, I joined about a month ago. So ah, I'm okay. just trying to learn as much as I can. So this is very helpful to um, just see how other people started out. Um, so I, I'm learning a lot. So this is very helpful. Oh, good, good. Do you, do you, have, a, do you have a setup or, or do no, you? No, I don't. Yeah. Okay. Well, then that's that's extremely smart of you, uh, because I tell yeah, my I, yeah yeah I can tell just by by watching these that you know there's a lot to learn before you go out and buy something. <laughs> yeah. Great. Yeah. I always, I always tell my my students at the end of my class I I teach a class in astrophotography, 
And I always tell them at the very end of the class, if you ever get the urge to buy something, don't. Just lay down, get over it, and, and join MAS and, and, and work with the club members and, and, and spend, spend time uh, learning about the telescopes out at the club and, and what the capabilities they have and, and, and kind of make a, a, a decision on where, what kind of imaging you want to do, whether it be visual or astrophotography and, and, and then seek some guidance from the members on, on, on what, on what to buy. Right. All right. That's the, the plan just to learn more Great. and learn what I can first. Super. All right. Any, anything else? Dennis, oh. I, let me Dennis, stop. I, let me, st let me stop recording. Hang on, Dennis. Hang on. Oh, I do have, I, it's a not on the topic of equipment and stuff, but I do have something that I can share that oh, Thomas good. and Agnes, okay. Tom and Thomas and Agnes were asking. They emailed me. <clears throat> they were out at my place uh, imaging the sun, and um, they were wondering how I colorize the my sun pictures because when I image the sun, I use my monochrome camera, and so I can quickly show you in about five minutes probably if i don't talk too much oh um, good yeah how I, do, how I do that so if you're still recording hopefully yeah i'm gonna i'll leave the i'll leave the recording going then all right let me um move some things around here and i'll share my screen yeah you you're you taught me how to do that uh jeff i may i don't remember what i taught you but I, maybe i might might have changed some things here yeah So hopefully I'm sharing the right screen. So you should see Photoshop, is that right? Uh, no, it just says Jeff has started screen sharing. It's still loading. Oh, now okay. we do, now we do. All right, All right. hopefully my connection won't it, slow down too much here. Um, but tell me if uh, it's too choppy or, or not, or maybe I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn off my camera too just in case, hang on one second. All right, never mind. I, I can't find that window. But anyway, so this is this is my starting point. So what I do is I, I, I capture the image in AutoStacker. I use Registax to then uh, use wavelets to um, sharpen the image and bring out some of this detail. And this is the output of Registax. This is the raw uh, output of Registax. So that's that's where I'm at in the in the process here. Um, and then I use Photoshop to do the rest, basically clean it up and colorize it. And so how I do that, um, the first thing I do is I get rid of some of this stuff that's on the outskirts here. So I crop the image down um, to to clean it up. Um, and then the first thing I do, and this is probably what I think is the, the key to um, my image, is at least what I think is the thing, is I go into this adjustments, shadows, highlights function that's in Photoshop. And now I've tweaked the settings here. Um, you guys, since this is a recording, you can uh, you know refer back later at these settings. But this is what I use. And I'll, I'll tweak them maybe a little bit. But it really brings out the prominences then. So if I turn it off, this is what it looked like before. And that's what it looks like after I apply this, this uh, mm. shadows highlights. Now, sometimes this accentuates the, the face of the sun too much that I don't like that. So I will use, I'll add a mask that will hide um, and only apply this shadows feature to the portion. But for the purposes here, I'm just going to leave it as is. Um, and the, again, these are my settings. So I hit OK. And this is about real time. I, it takes me about five minutes tops to do this portion. So the first thing I do is shadow highlights. Then I, I go in to colorize it. So I go to this color balance. Um, mm -hmm. And, I, you know, you could play with this to get your, your you know, what tint of orange you like. Um, but I've just adopted these numbers. So I, 
I leave it at this mid-tones selection here and I just type 75 there and then negative 75 there. That's the settings I use for that. And then depending on whether you like this orangish glow sky background, I don't really care for that. Um, but you do lose a little bit of the, the um, luminosity when you try to minimize that. I go into the shadows tone balance setting and then use negative 10 and 10. And so that knocks down that. It makes it a more of a black mm. sky. But you will notice that I did lose a little bit of the very, very faint um, neb neb uh, prominences there. And then from that, it's it's uh, kind of just enhance it a little bit. So I then do, um, I, I raise the vibrance up because I that's just what I like. Um, there's really no right or wrong uh, at this point. It's all, you know, what your taste is. I bump up the saturation a little bit to taste. You know, maybe that's a little much. Um, and then I think the last thing I, oh, I, I will occasionally because sometimes you know this like this side over here is a little bit blown out. I'll go in and adjust bit the levels and I'll raise the midpoint here just to to knock it down a little bit. And then the last thing is I may or may not this I don't always do this, but I do a little bit of sharpening. You know, I, sometimes I can get you know, carried away with sharpening, so I try to be very subtle. Um, I just have a very very subtle amount of sharpening. And this, this, I would save this. This is, this is a uh, finished image now. Mm. So that's, that's my technique from going from a black and white to a color image. Yeah, that was about 75% of what you showed me. And uh, the, that very first step is, is new. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. And so that this is, you know, this is the type of images that, I, that same technique that I just walked you through produces these these other images here that I've taken recently. This is with your 130? Yeah, the, the, all these really zoomed in views are with my 130, right? I've got some, I think I've got some other ones where... Um, They were the full disc, but yeah, you know, like here's a one that I took not too long ago. I'm, I'm using my uh, LUNT to take the wide field and then using my 130 to zoom in. You can, these are about, and these are just me drawing squares on the, on the picture, mm -hmm. but it's, a, it's about approximate representation of my field of view for my 130. And so this was the sun full disc that day. And then when I zoom in on this box, this is what it looked like over here. No, so it's, it, it, it's just amazing. Yeah. Um, the, even visually, you know, Thomas and Agnes were out and they, they looked through this visually. I think they were also impressed. I, I just can't get enough with this new, uh, chromosome or chromosphere quark that I, that I now mm -hmm. have. It's just fantastic. Jeff, what, what kind of, what kind of scope, uh, does, does that have, I know it, you can put it on a refractor, but does does it have to be a, a a triplet or can it be a doublet or what, what yeah, type of refractor can you work, work with that? In, any refractor. Um, the only limitations and if not limitations, the only guides they have is after, you know, up to, I think it's F5 to F7 or F4 to F7 is is their sweet spot for what the, the cork is designed for. Okay. Um, and then the, if you, the bigger, the more aperture you have. So if you're in the 130, 150 range, you have to start using a, um, a filter to kind of knock down the UVIR filter um, mm. to knock down some of the heat. But it, it's, I mean, I, th I think it's a very good addition to, to, you know, your existing telescope to, you know, have a solar scope for 1200 bucks. You know, my, wow. my, my lunt alone was $4,500. Right. That's just the scope. And then you, you need a mount and everything to go with it. And What is the name I mean, of that device, Jeff? A quark what? I, so it's called a, uh, Daystar is the company and it's called a quark. Yeah, 
And then they have two versions. One's a chromosphere version. It's supposedly tuned to observe the chromosphere. And then they have a different version that is the prominence that is supposedly tuned to really observe prominences. But I think 99% of people buy the chromosphere because you can see it does just a fantastic job at getting prominences yeah. as well. Yeah. And what, what was the cutoff, uh, Jeff, on aperture size before you needed extra filtering? I, you have to look at their website. I'm, I'm not, I don't want to cite something in cause I'm almost positive it's going to be wrong. Um, but it, they have a, they have a certain, um, F ratio and then aperture that combination, depending on what you have, they have a recommended filter that you would need. Yeah. And, and you had to, you had to put in that filter. Yep. I've got a yep. two inch UVIR, uh, filter that I put in front of the um, diagonal and then the, the cork goes into the diagonal. Yeah. Very nice. Well, that is, that is a, cause you could, you could get an, a nice used refractor. Yeah. You know, for 500 bucks. Oh, trust me. I, I I've been talking with Gabe about this for probably two years. And I said, man, I'm just going to buy like a, a 150 millimeter doublet. Right. Yeah. You can get, you can get those used pretty cheap and and uh, stick this thing on it i ended up just using my existing one but um i might get the aperture hungry again and, yeah. and want even more detail in the sun and then i'll do i'll do exactly that what you're saying i'll go find a a, a used 150 somewhere and buy that and in you you right now you're doing that on a on a doublet no i have a, a stellar view uh, 130, which is a, it's a triplet. Yeah. Okay. And no filter goes in the front of the scope when you use this? No. Nope. Wow. And you got, <laughs> I, I, I have two incidents now and, and Thomas and Agnes witnessed one of them, <laughs> uh, where I'm still learning to cautiously observe the sun. <laughs> one time, uh, I, I, I was imaging and uh, there was a piece of dust or something was on the, one of the optics. So I, I was trying to figure out and use my, my little blow gun thing, um, to, to blow off any specs that might be on the optics, not realizing that, you know, you're pointing at the sun and you pull that cork out to blow the dust off. Well, you've got a beam of light now that is <laughs> focused in my arm just passed in front of it. And it felt, <coughs> it felt like touching a hot stove. Uh, wow. Fortunately, I didn't look into it or anything. And then the other the other incident I had while Thomas and Agnes was here um, is the cork itself has dust covers on it, and the quarter inch and a quarter end you can insert the you can insert the cork without having removed that. And so that's exactly what I did. <laughs> I had the dust cover still on. I pointed it toward the sun, and then I'm wondering why is my image all of a sudden so cloudy. What what is going on here? And we figured it out, and you have to burn a hole through the little dust cover, and the soot from the burning uh, left a residue on my diagonal that fortunately just cleaned off really easily. But uh, yeah, you get so now I'm I'm making sure I anytime I do anything with the image train, I slew away from the sun now. 